It all began with our love for Mozart, as if we were looking for an excuse to go on a personal journey with him, to walk the streets he once walked many times, to see up close his writings and letters, and to breathe in the city that gave birth to this amazingly creative mind. It was an incredible treat for both of us to spend time with this collection of 16 sonatas. We were privileged to receive the support of the International Mozart Foundation, who allowed us to study manuscripts, first editions, and letters relating to the creation of these works. We also, through this occasion, came to realize the instrumental role the International Mozart Foundation plays in preserving, researching, disseminating, and promoting Mozart's creative output. In Salzburg, um, there exist three institutions with Mozarteum in their name. That's the University Mozarteum, that's uh, the Mozarteum Foundation, and the Mozarteum Orchestra. And um, all three institutions have the same origin, and the origin is uh, the Dom Musikverein and Mozarteum, which was founded in 1841. Um, the, the Mozarteum Foundation is now active in three main fields. Um, one is the research department. The most important project um, now currently of the research department is the digital Mozart edition where the work of Mozart is made available for free. Um, and um, yeah, this is a very important basis of the Mozarteum Foundation to have this, this research um, branch, to call it like this. The second part are the museums. There's the Mozart's birthplace and Mozart residence. We have up to 500,000 visitors a year in these museums and they take also place exhibitions and things like that. The third branch are the concerts and within the concert the, the heart of the activities there is the International Mozart Week happening every year around Mozart's birthday. That's the 27th of January and it's always 11 days around this and um, that, that we try to bring together the best Mozart interpreters worldwide and also all Mozart lovers worldwide. Um, but we have also the season concerts in our concert hall, the, the big hall of the Mozarteum Foundation, um, which is, I may say, one of the best hall in the world for chamber music and up to Mozart-sized orchestras. And we have the Dialoge Festival, which is more our experimental platform where we have more room for um, contemporary music for to try different concert formats and th things like that. The Mozarteum Foundation has a long tradition. It's now 133 years old. And what is fascinating is that the Mozarteum Foundation always had a relationship to the composers of their time. And it was always important for the Mozarteum Foundation to connect with nowadays. And um, it's very important to have the tradition on the one side, but to be innovative and um, to show contemporary music on the other side. It's also important to, to challenge Mozart, um, to yeah, give him sometimes a counterpart, um, things like that, not just to be kept in beautiness, to say it like this, but to, um, yeah, to, to try to, to, to combine it with uh, contemporary music and so on. And the, the experimental platform we have for that is the Dialoge, and that's something important for us. Uh, there we try um, to combine Mozart with a composer of the 20th century and with a composer of the 21st century. And um, for example, the next Dialoge, there we combine Georg Friedrich Haas, which is one of the most important composers in, in Austria. He's getting now a, uh, a professor in, in the Columbia University in New York. Um, we combine him with Charles Ives and Mozart. And um, there we try also in this Dialoge Festival to experiment with concert format, formats. I mean, we have this 
great hall, the big hall of the Mozarteum Foundation. It's a quite static hall, great acoustics, but that is, can be used also in different ways. That's very important to show within this series. And it's also important to combine concerts with different disciplines like dance, like video, like music with electronics, things like that. And um, to be there innovative, um, to challenge Mozart, as I said already, that's something what we try within this series especially. I mean, it's not just happening there. We have also in, within the Mozart week something like a composer in residence. And that's what, what we do. And it's important not just to serve the cliches of Mozart, but um, to, yeah, challenge to challenge it and to keep it alive. The beginnings of the library go back to the year 1841 when our predecessor institution was founded, the uh, Dommusikverein und Mozarteum, the Society for Music at the Cathedral and Mozarteum. Uh, from the very beginning we collected autograph materials uh, of Mozart, Mozart's letters, his music manuscripts, Mozart editions and also objects for the museum like paintings and all that stuff. But from the very beginning uh, the Mozarteum had a music school called Mozarteum for the uh, education of young musicians here in Salzburg, especially to improve the music at the cathedral and at the other churches. So we have also lots of material for musical education, the whole library of the music school from the 19th century here. The main part of our collection of original manuscripts came to our collection in the year 1844 from the estate of Mozart's younger son, Franz Xaver Mozart. He donated all the material he had inherited from the mother to our institution. That's the world's largest collection of letters by Mozart and the, let the Mozart family, and also the music manuscripts which were still in the possession of the family. When we talk about Mozart today, or when we find, try to find out something about Mozart's life, what he was thinking, how, we, how he was working, at least 90% of everything that we know in this direction comes from the letters. From the earlier years, especially from the letters of his father, because starting at a very early age, they were traveling all over Europe. And at that time, the father systematically wrote letters, not only to inform the family, but also all the friends and all of Salzburg, and especially the whole court and the archbishop, so that he can see uh, which tremendous uh, success the little boy had all over Europe. So this was, he was a very good marketing man. He really promoted his son and organized all this uh, the travels, uh, the concerts and everything. And he already developed uh, a kind of idea to uh, document Mozart's life by these letters. So he systematically kept the letters or had copies made for his own archive. So without these letters we would know much, much less than we do. So they are of extreme importance for us today. Uh, you have to know that Mozart did not only not finish works like the Requiem, but about 150 pieces he left that he never finished. Um, sometimes we know why he didn't finish them, but often we don't really know. But we know that he often wrote down like an idea when he was uh, uh, working and then just wrote down one or two pages more or less completely and then put it aside and maybe one or two years later he uh, began working on these pieces again and finished the works. That's for example with, some, with uh, some of the piano concertos we know that he worked in this way that he began and then finished them one or two years later. So he would probably have finished some of these works uh, if he had lived longer but I think he also was interested in documenting uh, his development and his earlier ideas because he also kept uh, pretty early compositions from the 1770s. He did not throw them away, but kept them uh, as a documentation or maybe as ideas for new compositions we don't really know. But 
at least he was not careless about his own manuscripts. Yeah, I'm very sorry we don't have the autographed manuscripts of the violin sonatas. They are spread all over the world. Uh, there are some in New York, in Washington, in London, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in Poland. So they are spread all over the world. Uh, but of course we try to uh, collect the information about of the whereabouts. What we have are two fragmentary violin sonatas, two sonatas which Mozart began to compose but never finished. We visited Salzburg several times during the two years prior to our recording, and the Biblioteca Musatiana became a familiar home base for our research. 481 cave. Oh, 481. In the second movement, actually, it has a very different dynamic marking. Yeah. But what about the articulation in 301? Yeah, 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 articulation. articulation also bum, bum, the bum, 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 bum. Yeah. It's like mm. completely. So it's really like for us, I mean, we are shocked. It's very interesting to see the first edition when um, this is only a piano score. Actually, it doesn't have the violin score written. Like nowadays, we have everything you know, written on one score. So it's really interesting to see that. We had interesting discussions about the sonatas with Dr. Armin Plinzing. And the trip to the manuscript vault was extremely informative. <laughs> That's very popular with all the paintings. I was paying you all the time. Oh, really? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, really? So they do the lot? Yeah, from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and here we have a letter of Mozart. You can see that uh, it looks a little bit uh, chaotic because uh, there's something written in between. That's because uh, Mozart, also his father, sometimes used uh, a kind of secret code where uh, after cer a certain rule, uh, single letters were interchanged. So you had to know this code, then you could read it. And Georg Nikolaus Nissen, the second husband of Constanze Mozart, who wrote the first big biography and printed many of these letters here, uh, deciphered this uh, code and wrote uh, the real meaning in between here and then printed the letter so in his book. So this is, is by the second husband? Yeah, the smaller one, yeah. He often made notes uh, in the letters also. Unfinished Sonata by Mozart for violin and cembalo. Um, this piece was composed in 1784, and it's interesting that it's written on the same paper as the sonata he composed for the uh, Madame Strina Sacchi. And you might argue that it's maybe a first attempt to compose a sonata. He composed uh, one other unfinished sonata at the same time, so maybe it has something to do with it. Uh, and there are some similarities, I think, at the beginning, how it starts with uh, the piano and uh, the violin together, and then a so very short uh, uh, intersection by... Seeing manuscripts, letters, and first editions give us such insight to Mozart's world. As 21st century musicians, being surrounded by so many texts and resources that all claim their unique offerings, we couldn't help but wonder. Yeah, the Mozarteum Foundation has been working for a long time on the text of Mozart's works, and the decisions were made in the 1950s, and now, 60 years later, we may have to reconsider some of these ideas. When the Neue Mozart Ausgabe started, people were convinced that there is one definite text and that we only have to look carefully in the sources in order to find this. Now, we are more convinced that there is a broad spectrum and that every source can tell us something, but none of the sources can tell us all.
And so if you have several editions of Mozart's works, which all claim to have the urtext, meaning the original text of Mozart's sonatas, they may be still quite different. This has something to do that the editor makes decisions and may adapt one slur to another because he sees that in a later instance in the movement the articulation is different. But most often and the most obvious differences result from different sources to be used. The Neue Mozart Ausgabe was in the fortunate situation that for most of Mozart's works we have the original manuscripts at hand and clearly no one knows better what Mozart wants than the composer himself. But the Neue Mozart Ausgabe only gradually learned that sometimes printed editions can tell more than the autographs and this is particularly true for chamber music because when Mozart gave away a piece to the publisher for a broad market, the situation was different. When he was playing the pieces with his friends or with his students, he could exactly tell them what to do. And for the broad market, he had to tell people how to make one good solution. And therefore, there may be really differences, let's say added dynamics or differences in slurring. But all this has to do with the fact that in the 18th century, a musical piece was not entirely fixed and that the composer did not even strive to write it down exactly as he wanted to, but he was really hoping that the players were well informed and intelligent enough to bring in a little bit of their own personality. Still, this does not answer the question how to deal with a musical text and a printed edition has to make a decision. Do I use the autograph as the main source? Do I use the first print? Or do I even use other sources as the main text? And we are now working into a new century of Mozart editions, namely the digital Mozart edition. The digital Mozart edition was installed at the initiative of the Packard Humanities Institute in California as a cooperation with the Mozarteum Foundation. And the primary idea was to regard the text of the Neue Mozart Ausgabe as something that we would like to preserve and to share with as many people as possible. You can practically go to any library in the world and check the Neue Mozart Ausgabe on the shelves, be it in Europe, be it in the United States, be it in Asia. But for performances, this is more complex. So we know, for example, that there are only a handful of copies of the printed Neue Mozart Ausgabe in South America. And so if someone plays Mozart, he will probably not use the Neue Mozart Ausgabe. So the first step was to digitize the entire Neue Mozart Ausgabe and offer it for free on the internet for everybody who wants to use it for private study, for academic research, or for teaching purposes. Thanks to the Mozart Foundation, we were invited to view and to play Mozart's own instruments. The light actions we felt from these instruments surprised us and gave us a new perspective from which to approach the interpretation of Mozart's music. Here you see the original violin of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. It was made in Mittenwald in Bavaria, that's near the Austrian border, and it was made by one member of the Klotz family we think it was Egidius Klotz. Uh, the interesting thing is inside there is a label on which is written it was made by Steiner, but that not true. This label should only say that it is a model after a Steiner violin. And Mozart used this instrument here in Salzburg for composing and playing on it. He composed several uh, violin uh, concerts on it and then he left this instrument here in Salzburg when he moved to Vienna. And in Vienna he bought another violin which he was using then there.
And on the other side, you see viola of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. It was made in northern Italy, in Brescia, and Mozart used this instrument uh, also during his time in Vienna. And here, uh, on the fingerboard, you see a, a, a silver-plated label in which are written all the owners of the instrument after Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So it's really interesting for us, so we have a good provenience of all owners of this instrument. Could you tell me about um, the owners of the violin? Mm -hmm. The violin, when Mozart went to Vienna, he left it here in Salzburg, and then it was in the property of his sister Nannal, and she gave it then to a pupil of her, and then it, it came into private property here in Austria, and our foundation could buy this instrument in the year 1956. Mm -hmm. And the other instrument, here it are written all the owners of the violin. One of them was also a violin player, then it was given to Earl of Lovelace in Great Britain, and then it came also to a man in uh, USA. Mm -hmm. And from this, out of this property, our foundation could buy this instrument in 1966. Yes, wonderful. And um, I see that this violin is really in mint condition, yes. almost no cracks, and um, has it been repaired? Or? Yes, it had been repaired, and, and for instance the fingerboard has also been replaced because all these are parts which uh, are in permanent use and have to be replaced during the centuries. So for, except for the fingerboard, everything is exactly the same? Uh, the strings are not the yeah, same, course, you know, yeah. and, and also the, bridge. the, the bridge. Yeah, but but the, the mainly pa main part of the instruments are original, yes. Oh, it's so light. Mm, it's so light, yeah. really light, yes. And the viola? The viola. Much more <laughs> damaged. Yes. Uh, the viola has been a little bit larger originally. It's, it has been cut off about one inch in the 19th century to make a standard size out of it. Okay. During Mozart time, the body was a little bit larger. So do you have the bows? No, the bows are not existing anymore. Mm -hmm. And all uh, artists want, want, they want to use their own bows. I'm sitting in front of this pianoforte. It's um, an instrument built by Anton Walter, a very famous piano maker in, in the late, late decades of the, 20, of the 18th century. So this instrument was built in 1780. And we know from, from the letters that Mozart, he loved piano music. I think for me personally, Mozart, Probably the piano was him the beloved instrument, and we know that he he played on the on the pianoforte of Stein, and he wrote to the father, "Oh, a quite good piano." And otherwise, he in, in Paris he 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 informed a horrible instrument in the hall, so and so. And Mozart used this pianoforte for all his academies. The Amadeus movie, it's it's a story, and, and but what is absolutely right is when you see. The, the, the man, the servants, 
carrying the pianoforte. And originally, this piano was brought from one house to the other. And in, in a way, to own this instrument and to be able to present it is great and is wonderful. This makes our institution unique because it's only here, only here in Salzburg you can, you can hear the Mozart pianoforte in this small hall, which is really, really perfect for, for the way this music is, is presented or in our um, concert hall in the Mozarteum. Um, part of Mozart's um, literature, musical literature, are the pieces for forehand, piano forehand um, playing, and um, the sonatas are marvelous, full of full of um, lovely ideas in the in the themes and the way how it is how it is uh, composed. My interpretation that Mozart composed quite a lot of pieces for hand is he used this literature for teaching young ladies, aristocratic ladies, and having the opportunity to sit forehand playing very near together gave him a so near, a, a nearness he wouldn't have had normally. It was a time of quite a distance to the special between male and female, man and female. So I know you, you perform the piano, you're a wonderful pianist. I invite you to play one um, forehand piece together with me sitting next to me. Would be, would be a lovely experience for me. The recording process, to us, was a pilgrimage to Mozart's world. His joy, tears, dark side, and the profoundness of how deeply he understood the human condition. Even as we completed our recordings, we felt as if we had just begun. We were left feeling energized, contemplating the infinite possibilities of his music, and struck with a desire to dive deeper into the sonatas and to learn them all over again.
first the idea popped up because you know it uh, I loved playing Mozart but it was uh, very hard to find a pianist that really can play Mozart. I mean there are a lot of pianists that can play wonderfully but to be able to play Mozart I think you just need to know the language of Mozart otherwise you know it doesn't matter what you do it just somehow doesn't speak the Mozart character and when I I remember very well when I uh, was studying in Eastman and um, we were uh, schoolmates and I um, in played a Mozart and then I was very impressed by her, <laughs> her Mozart so I thought oh it would be wonderful to play these sonatas with her so I asked her I asked her I don't know two years ago or a year and a half yeah I think summer. I think it was two years if ago she would be uh, two and a half years ago I think, yeah if yeah. she would be interested and then we finally step by step made this uh, project well, Thank Ben, is you. it really flattering? I, I hope I live up to that. <laughs> to that. Uh, but to me, I am just a, just a totally um, passionate lover for Mozart's music, and and I truly do feel him in 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 many ways. And I think uh, his uh, viewpoint toward the world or the, his personality is somewhat similar to how I feel. Um, I hope. So uh, so it really feels like a dream come true, and and mm. Ben is just such a beautiful violin player, and he makes the uh, you know Mozart really alive and singing on his violin. So it's really a privilege to play with her. We can definitely see the progress from Opus One to Opus Two and to the last four sonatas composed in Vienna. So in case you're not familiar with the Opus 1 and 2. Opus 1 was um, the six sonatas 301 to 306 that were published in Paris, right? As yeah. the Opus 1 uh, during uh, when, when Mozart was alive. And then um, Opus 2 was published in, in Vienna in, in 1781. 1781. Um, so, of course, later on we have this key number, but at the time it was sort of clearly designated and, and published as group of sonatas and we can we can see why these were grouped as a set right yes um, the first set of six sonatas opus one the music is just um, ingenious and um, you can just feel this fresh spirit in every piece we every time we play them we get so excited <laughs> just we're so amazed just astonished by his yeah, amazing music is just sort of unfold by itself yeah it's just uh, so, so natural natural and, and, and bubbling and yeah. a lot but in terms of texture I don't yeah think. in terms of texture the later ones are much more uh, sophisticated and um, I think he really reached a new level of composing for these two instruments right I think the other day you were sharing with me regarding uh, the violin roles Yes. And then opus one. Yeah, the opus one um, violin mostly is doubling the piano or imitating the piano. Then um, to the uh, opus two, you can feel the change. The violin has a voice of its own. Yeah, sometimes very becoming, dramatic roles. Yes, yeah, very total dramatic. equality. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, and so this reminds me of this letter written by Mozart um, during his trip. Uh, of job searching, I think, in Mannheim and Munich, he wrote this letter to his father Leopold, mentioning that uh, he's sending his sister Nonero a set of uh, uh, six duets written by uh, Johannes Schuster, um, and he was saying that uh, the reason that he sent this uh, collection to his sister is for the sister and father to amuse between themselves. So that yes. means that that, sh that really shows this was uh, a a very domestic genre of music. Yes, and absolutely. play and people play at home and and they enjoy each other. And then the violin sort of like probably had a much more accompanying role than yes. and the equal uh, equal role and later on in, in the sonata. Yes, uh, these sonatas are called um, uh, clavier sonatas uh, with violin accompaniment. Yeah, so this is a, a tradition from the older like yes. the baroque time, the yeah. pre-classical yeah. time. So um, actually, the violin really, uh, even though it has a lot of um, uh, solos and uh, you know uh, themes of its own, 
um, most of the time it's accompanying the piano, mm -hmm. uh, which I find very difficult actually. Playing accompaniment is much, much more difficult than playing solo. Absolutely. For um, the piano, it's the same thing. The most difficult passages are, are the accompaniment. Yeah. And the later sonatas, you really feel he uh, achieved such equality with these two instruments, um, especially in uh, K454, oh, uh, yeah, that's which the big one. Is composed uh, was composed in Vienna in 1784 for Strina Sacchi, the uh, Italian violinist. Um, yeah, I think he really had her in mind when he composed this sonata for her. Yeah, and you told me a really great story about it. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and well, as you know, it's not the first time that Mozart composed something in a very short time and didn't write out the piano part at all and just performed it uh, in his memory. Well, uh, yeah, I, I guess he does this very often. Yeah, so he didn't even deliver the violin part to Strina Sachi um, until the day of the concert. <laughs> so probably she just side-read it uh, in the concert. She must be amazing. And. Yeah. Um, and after the concert, Mozart played uh, at the forte piano, and you know he had a score in front of him, but actually there's nothing written in the score. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the King Joseph, uh, Emperor Joseph, um, came to him later and asked him, "May I see the score?" And Mozart, you know, showed him the score, and he, there is nothing written, just empty score. So. Uh, did you, did you actually see the, the copy of the manu manuscript of this particular sonata? Uh, yeah, the copy, yeah, of course. So, so how, how is it? Is it like neat on the Yeah, on the manuscript? definitely neat. Oh, so he actually written out much later. Yeah, so, I'm sure so he wrote it out, yeah. yeah. So Emperor Joseph said, um, you venture that again? <laughs> and Mozart answered, uh, may it please your majesty, not a single note was lost. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he did this for 379 as well, as well. which is another piece that, that he wrote. It's called an hour sonata, yeah, right? Because yeah. he wrote, uh, supposedly he wrote this sonata within an hour, between 11 and 12 in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, but we believe that he didn't just compose this in a, w in a whim. He sort of already has all these ideas sort of brewing in his mind. And, and in fact, I think Mozart does this a lot. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. He has like a storage, he has like a system of storing these really great themes yeah. or, you know, just great music. And then he just hush them out sometimes later. Yeah. And I think it just overflows yeah. from his <laughs> mind or his heart. like cannot contain them. Right? <laughs> he had to write them out. That's right, yeah. So he probably just spent that hour to write down those notes, but, but those the notes have been yeah. with him for, for a long time. Yeah. So the later sonata, in a nutshell, definitely has a, a much more sophisticated texture, has yes. a lot more variety in terms yes. of dialogues. I think yeah. piano and violins are not only like alternating, we're like kind of like juxtaposing uh, each other yeah. or we're like opposite roles. Yes. There are a lot of opera characters uh, yeah, opera. So sort of emerging in the later sonatas. Yeah, I think um, the early sonatas, uh, 301 to 306, were mainly uh, influenced by um, orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of orchestral influence because he spent um, a lot of his time in Mannheim, and he yeah. composed most of them in Mannheim. Absolutely, like 305. <laughs> yeah, 302. <laughs> like that, that, but 302, yeah. absolutely. Those huge, like Mannheim yeah, rockets, rocket. so called. Yeah, huge crescendos definitely yeah. remind us of this particular era. And later, when he started writing operas, his mm -hmm. first mature operas, he really, um, we can really hear those uh, operas in. You can hear the characters in those sonatas, and especially the, in the in the violin parts. You know, I was yeah, just thinking today. Also, of yeah, also story, the yeah. yeah the arias and the and the characters just yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you know, if, for example, this uh, this G minor on Dante. You know, yeah, 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 I was just thinking this this is definitely not written for piano. This yeah. is so much more singing on the violin. I know. Part, but I'm, I'm just sorry so for, hard. I feel sorry for you, pianist. 
<laughs> and especially I'm thinking like on the forte piano. I mean, because forte piano is so crystal. But like how to like really sustain the the sound? I mean, of course with the the pedal, the knee lever or whatever. But maybe also with timing. Yeah, just with timing. The so it, it requires you know, so much more, you know, expression and character on the on yeah. the instrument. Um, first of all, playing all sixteen sonatas, just the, the sheer quantity of the music <laughs> is a great challenge. Just to learn the notes. Yeah, I, I actually can't believe at this point that we just finished the recording. This, I mean, I, I yeah. used to think this is just. I think you, uh, it, I think uh, at one time, even though we have played them, mm -hmm. um, we have rehearsed them, and we hadn't performed them. We felt like uh, we didn't even know. Like uh, sometimes we got confused with which movement belongs yeah, cause, to which. Yeah, because because we learned all <laughs> sixteen together. It's not like we have yeah. known them. I mean, I, I've played some of them. Yeah, uh, I've played quite some, of, yeah. a lot of them. But you know, uh, probably half. Yeah. Let's say, but but this is like know, a systematic, yeah, them, systematically <laughs> learning this collection. It's it's really yeah, quite ambitious. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I think after yesterday, um, we really. I mean, we, we know the themes upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, <laughs> well, that I mean, you name it, you name it, like, a, you know, just any and phrase. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. we really know them by heart. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. I feel like a living with this, these sonatas for a while. Yeah, yeah just uh, the, the sheer, you know, numbers of them. Volume. Learning yeah. of them just, uh, yeah, took us a while to, to know these sonatas really well. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I think, of course, to to find the right character for each sonata. Yeah, that and, that's that's really the main challenge. Yeah, I think yeah. that was the big big one of the probably yeah. the main challenge. Absolutely, yeah. and I think um, personally, um, we discussed this. Finding the right tempo is is really the essence of finding the character as well. At, yeah, at least we would say like very, part of the the important. essence of it. Yeah. yeah, and up until the recording session, we were still kind of a uh, Discussing and 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 yeah. exploring um, the better tempo, and I think we actually changed one. Yeah, we one of we the actually stars. changed yeah. quite a, a few things yeah. in, during the recording because I think it's really a learning it's a process. Constant, yeah, yeah, constantly it's like, exploring. You know, until you ever have gotten there, you're just yeah, uh, yeah it's a journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so what we do is we compare. We try to find the reference of the yes. tempo among. Um, the sonatas, like some of the tempi, uh, we try to make them consistent among the tempo di minuetto, for example. Um, we compare the andante um, among the andantes, or com compare andante with andante cantabile, andante satanudo, and, and cantabile, all of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, it, yeah, it's a. There's a lot to to explore and to learn from finding a good tempo. Yeah, through this experience. Okay, also, just <clears throat> to um, feel each other's um, yeah, that's say, temperament that's, or yeah. spirit mm -hmm. through uh, collaborating with each other was mm -hmm. also you know a big challenge. Sometimes we got into discussions or mm -hmm. like even we fight with each other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to play like this, and she wants yeah, to play like exactly. this. So like, it's articulation a, is another uh, thing yeah. too. Yeah, like ornaments. Yeah, and, uh, ornaments, articulations, and trying to have have the right sound for yeah. for a certain you know things and to match mm -hmm. each other in you know, all those things. I yeah. think just a lot of things. Um, yeah, that are we did really do a lot of research on that too. And um, Vin was telling me um, she was so excited after. Reading the violin uh, treatise from uh, Leopold Mozart, and, yeah. and I think you were really inspired by, by yes. some of the ornaments yeah. that he explained in his book. And, yeah. um, but then we can just borrow and, and just take exactly, literally from the text. We have to consider um, based on the, the music, based on the character. Of the, yes. So it's it's hard to make a wise. Choice, and then we're just trying. Um, what we chose is is what we what feel we right what we feel moment. right at this moment. It we might may change. change uh, <laughs> very, yeah. You you don't know, right? Yeah. 
it just uh, really I feel it's um, constantly De evolving. discovering yeah. you know discovering and evolving yeah yeah um, and for recording I think it's really challenging for us to match the sound and color um, and especially because I'm playing on the Steinway, <laughs> yeah, not a forte I, I, piano. I wish I, I, think, I think the Steinway, this Steinway, is particular Steinway, this, this, this particular is Steinway really is beautiful. not bad. I would say, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because um, this Steinway uh, in the Solitaire Hall actually has a very um, translucent uh, upper register um, and uh, quite a, cr a crystal sound. And the bass is not as heavy as a lot. Yeah. Steinway could be so it, it really sort of relieved me a lot <laughs> yeah because um, uh, previously we were looking for other um, uh, venues for recording and and um, it didn't work out because of the instruments it didn't work out because of the resonance or, or yeah. acoustic of the hall so we're lucky to find the right, right venue and, and yeah. instrument for it but it's still challenging to match um, yeah of course sound absolutely challenging yeah, absolutely. yeah but i don't think we could have had a better venue and better situation yeah. for our recording yeah. just ideal yes this absolutely. hall and this instrument and all the yeah. people that help us but when we tried on the on the forte piano the other day, the piano forte piano with the violin, yeah, yeah, everything yeah. just it, it feels right. Yeah, well, that was you know, the when I I played Mozart's um, violin. violin today, mm -hmm. and I felt like I played a few phrases from the sonatas, mm -hmm. I felt like it really made me play differently. Oh, really? Yeah, of course. Wow. Yeah, I just what's felt, the difference? I felt the, um, especially the 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 slow you know movements mm -hmm. you you cannot really play so slow yeah it's like because the the, the, the sound it is not, not so that. so um rich yeah. as the modern mm -hmm. instrument but it has a, such a refined quality yeah. that you know you just want to make it flow because yeah. it's a just a really lighter sound yeah. and flowing sound so mm. absolutely mozart had a different tempi in mind i, I think, think so yeah. but you know i think this is one of the uh, Paradox, probably. Paradox, yeah, yeah, you can discuss because um, with instruments, different instruments, of course, make you play differently. Right. And you have to work with what you have and make the best out of it without distorting the music, right. but at the same time, being expressive on your instrument mm -hmm. without completely copying, you know, what the other instrument would sound, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would just make it. That's another it, thing. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Um, I don't think we we I, need to like pedantically follow whatever some some um, scholastic uh, treatise writes or you know, because um, because there are a lot of musicologists now. They're so they, you know they sort of dictate. Um, um, Mozart's music or Bach's music need to, be, to played be played in, in certain yeah, way. a certain way. Yeah. But the thing is, we're really dealing with different instruments. And yeah. the thing is, Mozart would have really appreciated Steinway piano, yeah. I think. So, um, or and the modern uh, violin. Yeah, yeah. And if you have a Steinway piano, yeah. you cannot play with. Them. So I mean, like, <laughs> I, I really believe like we we should work with what we have and and truly bring out the merits of the modern instrument yes. and and to try Definitely. to reflect. Yeah. As close as possible, Mozart's character, yeah, but definitely. on a developed instrument, yeah, and, and why not? So this is our uh, choice, yeah. and why we decided to do this collection um, on modern, on modern instru instruments. instruments. We did think about uh, doing yeah. on the period instrument, but of course there's the logistic problems. There's, you know, then yeah. this concern that that we just uh, talked about. So. Mm -hmm. Mozart's book, he divided the appoggiaturas into two different kinds. One is accented appoggiatura and one is unaccented appoggiatura. The unaccented appoggiatura, we can give it another terminology, which is grace note, which are, we are more familiar with. Now we are looking at accented appoggiatura. Uh, Leopold Mozart categorized the accented appoggiatura into two different categories. One is long and one is short. The long one has two different kinds. The first one takes 
half of the value of the main note. For example, here we have um, this is is a, an appoggiatura. The A takes half of the value of the G, and the second one is the note takes actually longer value of the um, main note, uh, which usually happens in um, dotted rhythm. For example, if we have a partitura uh, on a dotted rhythm, here we have an example in five, uh, four, five, four. This phrase. The last partitura is written. This is a um, dotted rhythm, and the partitura should take actually longer value of the main note. And then when it, there is a turn, we do it. But for a long time, I have been doing this as if the appoggiatura is a grace note, which is not correct according to Leopold Mozart's book. And actually, playing like this makes this line much more singing, much more smooth, and which is the purpose of appoggiatura. So the second kind of uh, accented appoggiatura is the short accented appoggiatura, which um, happens often also in, in this sonatas. For example, in 301, the second movement, in the minor section, we have This is a um, short appoggiatura, um, which makes the um, music uh, lively and uh, flowing. For the unaccented appoggiatura, which now we give the name of grace note, we also find many examples in these um, sonatas. Normally, it happens in repeated notes, for example, or um, fast, lively, uh, movements uh, with a turn uh, ending with a grace note like um, you don't that doesn't really work for the for the music. So um, with all these kind of different appoggiaturas and grace notes, we really give make uh, the music much more uh, lively and much more expressive according to what they should be. And really interesting and fun aspect of this whole rehearsal and preparing for this project is the collaboration and color matching between the two instruments, the violin and the piano. And we find it very, very challenging to do it correctly on this modern instrument. Because after trying the forte piano, we have a totally different understanding of how we should voice and bring out the texture on this instrument which doesn't have the quite um, lucid and, and translucent sound, especially in the bass register. So for example, in 301, on this instrument, it's really, really difficult to make the accompanying part very clear yet soft. So this is how it sounds like on this instrument. However, on the forte piano, this sounds totally different. I will be able to hear every note in my part, yet still keep it really, really soft. So as you can see, everything is so much clearer on the forte piano. So what do we do? on this instrument, we have to adjust the voicing and we have to almost adjust articulation. For me, I disregard the slurs pretty much. I, I try to do it just with a sense of slurring, but without really doing legato in my fingers. So in the right hand, I do. This way, there is still possibility to hear every note clearly. And I need to bring out the left hand much more. 
because on the forte piano, without trying, the left hand can be very clear. However, on this instrument, it simply doesn't happen. Similarly, for the opening of a 304, I have to do exactly the same because on the forte piano, everything sounds so clear and then naturally the line is almost like a non-legato on the forte piano. So sometimes pianists has question about whether they should do legato in the beginning of the 304. If they try the forte piano, I think the question is really self-explanatory because it's simply not really possible to make a really, really legato on the forte piano, unless, of course, you add the knee, uh, the pedal. In this sonata, um, the violin is often in a, an accompanying role. So in order to play well the accompaniment, um, the violin has to really um, make a lot of different sound, different articulations, different moods. Uh, Leopold Mozart actually gave great credit to somebody who can accompany well. Uh, he says, if you cannot accompany well, you better not play the solo, because it takes a great musician to actually play accompaniment well. I find it's very challenging, actually it's true throughout these sonatas. Uh, it's much easier to play solo part. Uh, but it's very difficult to play the company because you have to constantly change your colors, constantly change your sound, your articulation in order to match the um, piano part. So here is an example where I start uh, as the accompanist, then I change to the solo. Uh, this, this is the beginning of the first movement of 5, 4, 7. <laughs> Thank you. 